And after every Super Bowl, I start redecorating. Up goes the March Madness brackets. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. And I'd like to thank you for allowing me into your homes each week as we do these shows. Uh, each week I try to connect current sports with yesterday to give a, a real sense of nostalgia and history to all our sports fans out there. And with that, uh, obviously, with the end of the Super Bowl, really, uh, March Madness is rolling in basically within two weeks. And this year with the COVID, I don't believe any of the leagues are actually playing uh, postseason conference tournaments. So we're going to go basically from the end of the season, how it used to be, uh, right into the invites by the NCAA selection committee. And that should be uh, kind of interesting. In fact, I, I'm, I'm under the guise of where there are some conferences that have just completely shut down, like the Ivy Leagues. Just just invite all the teams because you don't know uh, with the COVID factor uh, how many of these teams are going to, let's say, have to uh, cancel or go under uh, quarantine. Uh, during the tournament. So, you know what? Just invite everybody and try to make it as fun as possible. Obviously, they're going to do it in one location this year, similar to the uh, NHL with the bubbles. So it should be interesting. And I'll get into that a little bit later on uh, in the uh, calendar year as uh, March starts to beckon and the warm weather starts to uh, infect us with spring madness and with that March madness as well. And um, I'd like to just turn my attentions to this. I know that we are, everyone is probably uh, in a down from uh, the Super Bowl. And this is the first week in about umpteen weeks where <laughs> your wife hasn't bothered you <laughs> while you're sitting on the couch to do something because you were watching a game and didn't want to be bothered. And, and now you're probably hiding from your wife <laughs> because you, you don't want to do any of those honeydew uh, uh, jobs on her honeydew list. But here's an interesting thing. And I, I thought we could turn our attention on this. And of course, this kind of started, and I guess my whole uh, and I've talked to Howard uh, in the past about this. I, I guarantee that most baseball fans and most real sports uh, fanatics and all things sports, many of them probably started getting involved in uh, the whole essence of, of sports history through trading cards. Uh, obviously, growing up, we had the Topps baseball cards for a while there. When I was growing up, it was only the Topps baseball cards. And uh, I would collect them every, starting in April of every year. I never ordered the sets like they do today. Uh, although, not to be hypocritical, I started doing that back in, I don't know, a few years ago. I tried to uh, recollect or start up my collection again. And I just found it just uh, too overwhelming. And really what I should have done was just concentrate on collecting from one particular company. Uh, having a multitude of trading car companies and you're trying to get back into it, it makes it an arduous task. That being said, there is something romantic, something that is Americana about baseball card collecting. And I know this, most uh, baseball fans, and I'm going to tell you this, most baseball card collectors, if uh, they did collect when we were young, they either kept them in an old shopping bag like me, or they kept them in several uh, shoe boxes. And of course, they met the ultimate uh, <laughs> finality of their existence when mom threw them out. Uh, and we all uh, just sit there and wonder, oh, how much would my set be worth and all the rest of it? Well, I had a 1970 set. wasn't complete, but I had my favorite player, Johnny Bench, on it. It was really the first year I started collecting baseball cards. And what I most remember is getting just starting. And uh, anybody who collected baseball cards know that you, they, they used to cost a dime, maybe a quarter, and you got 10 cards in it for a quarter. And of course, in my past uh, Park Ridge sports history, you'll know that in the 1970, you always got doubles, triples, quads. Uh, 
I, I can't even go up to the number, but one particular player I got over and over and over again was a guy by the name of Carl Taylor, who played for the Cardinals for a couple of years, and I think Montreal. And I used to get him in every every bag or box or package of cards I purchased, and uh, that was one of my big memories about the 1970 uh, cards. But also, I can't tell you how much satisfaction I got that year out of collecting so many of the all-star players from that 70 and 69 group. As I mentioned, I got Johnny Bench kind of early. And I just, well, he's my favorite player of all time. My brother, Jim, turned me on to the Reds. And in particular, to to, uh, Johnny Bench in the 69 all-star game. I always thought it was kind of cool that these guys were actually making their living playing baseball. I always thought they were plumbers or carpenters and stuff. And they did this on the weekend. Anyway, I did get him early. I remember getting Willie Mays. He was late in the uh, issue. I know I'm probably wrong when I'm saying this, and my uh, top baseball card aficionados can probably attest to this. I think Mays might have been number 628 or 650. He was late issue. And I remember getting him in August, along with Tony Perez, who probably was outside of – Pete Rose, one of my brother Jim's favorite players was Tony Perez because of his consistency. Always loved Perez. And we got him late in the year. And I can still remember Perez is swinging a bat and he has on a red, um, what we used to call a golf jacket underneath his regular thing. So you knew it was taken during spring training. Anyway, uh, a couple other guys I got in that set. Ernie Banks. I remember getting Ron Santo. I don't remember getting Tom Seaver that year. I do remember getting him, I think, the following year in 1971. The 71, now, the 70 cards always just uh, have a special uh, feeling for me because they were really the first set that I was really, uh, really uh, uh, attracted to and attached to. And we did so many uh, memorable things with that 70 sets, flipped the cards, Uh, play baseball in the backyard. We tried to assemble, let's say, a starting lineup for each team, collecting the cards, et cetera. So that 70 70 cards were really amazing. And I have looked at the price. And of course, if you have mint condition of that 70 set, it is uh, pretty valuable compared to uh, many of the sets of the time. But uh, the reason I bring all this up is that recently I had some work done in my house. And this is the weirdest thing. The worker came up to me and said, uh, Will, I got to show you something. And I thought, oh, man, he's working on something. And don't tell me we got a problem or, (laughs) you know, I got a varmint problem or something like that. And all of a sudden, he just came up to me and said, look what I found behind. And we have a pine uh, room in in our back, uh, in our back living space, uh, our TV room. It's all pine. And he was pulling uh, one of the knotted pines out to do some work. And in it, he found not one, not two, not three, not four, not five. He found six baseball cards from the 1950s. And I'd like to go over them with you today because I think they'll bring back many memories. And I just think it's payback for all the times we've had our moms throw these away on us when we wanted to keep them. And uh, it's, it's, it's just a great thing. So I have Ned Garver. He, he found Ned Garver, a guy named Ray Herbert, uh, Johnny Briggs, not the Johnny Briggs from Patterson, New Jersey. He was African-American. This is the white Johnny Briggs who pitched for the Cubs. And we'll get into that in a second. Uh, another great one. This is uh, Bobby Adams. All right. I'm going to, I'll pull these down. I just want to show you. He kept doing this to me. He said, look, I found this one and this one and this one and this one. And of course, then he found a guy by the name of Fred Kipp. And when I was looking up some information, I found a really fascinating story about Kipp because originally I thought it said Fred King and there was no listing. And then I saw Fred Kipp and I was like, wow. And then here is the creme de la creme, I guess. It's these famous ones, Destruction Crew, uh, the Cleveland 
Indian trio of Minnie Minoso, Rocky Calavito, and Larry Doby. Now, these cards are tops because it does say that. They are from 1959, I do believe. But I'd like to like explore some of these. And of course, what else attracted me to the Topps cards was they always had a cartoon on the back. It was always like, Joe goes to night school during the off season, or Joe loves to hunt and fish uh, in the off season. You have a picture of him with a gun and a fishing, fishing rod and all the rest, or you have him in a uh, cap and gown as he's going to night school and all the rest of it. But this was payback. I'm telling you, it's payback for all of us baseball card collectors uh, who lost their cards to mom and growing up and cleaning out the attic or the cellar or whatever, and them not calling us and saying, hey, I found all these old baseball cards. What do you want me to do with them? No, they just threw them out because they said Junior doesn't want them anymore. But there is so much history. There's so much Americana. And listen, I'm going to get right into it. So here's a picture of Ned Garver. Now, Ned Garver, I knew about from a book that my brother Ed had given me. It was called The Great Baseball Card Collecting. And I, I, I would love to do a tribute to that book. I have not seen it. Uh, I got, he, he gave me one of the original editions back in the early 70s. And basically what it was, it was a card collectors talking about their youth, great essays about growing up and being a kid and all the rest of it. And them taking all these great cards and then doing a little uh, synopses about the different players or having some fun with their pictures. There's one uh, I'll have to show you of Johnny Unitas that they stick in there. And it looks like, as they said, Johnny Unitas has a crew cut and it looks like he's got this face on and it looked like someone had taken, I don't know, pliers and pulled up the bristles in his crew cut, driving him crazy. And uh, the authors just would pop in with some great, great humor some great stories, and I hope to kind of be in the same realm. But Ned Garver was one of the guys that I remember as a kid. And when uh, the worker Brian came to me and said, wow, I said, Brian, you found this guy, Ned Garver. He was like, he won 20 games. He, he might've been the last player in the American League to win 20 games for a last place team. And I remember reading about that in that baseball book. And he did it with the St. Louis Browns. He won actually 20 games with the St. Louis Browns, who won 52 games that year. It is very similar, although he doesn't have the same stats as Hall of Famer Steve Carlton. But he, he, his season was very similar in many respects to Carlton's 72, his greatest season when he went 27 and 9 or 27 and 10 with the uh, Phillies. And he's, they only had 59 uh, total wins. And remember, uh, that was also a strike season. So most teams lost about 11 or 12, maybe even 13 games on the season. So for him to win uh, 27 games, basically in 156 games was pretty extraordinary. Plus he also led in innings pitched and strikeouts and I think complete games. He he was the whole nine yards that year, uh, Carlton in 72. Uh, but anyway, Garver won. And, and this is the interesting thing. He has a very high war record uh, or war. Yeah. Uh, wins above replacement. And, you know, I'm still trying to determine whether I really love it. Uh, I don't know whether, it, you know, they've tried to make it uh, baseball today as almost like it's the be all and end all. I know you'll get arguments. No, no, no. This is just another measurement of a player's abilities and all the rest of it. I get it. But too many uh, uh, of today's uh, journalists and pundits, are relying on the war. And it still fascinates me how some guys have really low wars and they have outstanding records. And then there are other guys who have really high wars. And you say, well, what did they do for that? And the guy who I always think about is Willie Davis. Take a look at Willie Davis, who played for the Dodgers. I've mentioned him in the past too as, as being uh, uh, wrongly labeled. Uh, not make uh, as uh, it was Tommy Davis by Wikipedia standards making the 71 All Star game when it was Willie Davis uh, who made the All Star uh, team that year. But Davis 
I think he's one of two guys besides Bobby Mer. Uh, I think Bobby Mercer was the other. They're the only two guys who are non-Hall of Famers to get hits in that game. All the rest were home runs or were, you know, doubles by future Hall of Famers. Uh, Killebrew, Bench, Clemente, uh, Aaron, etc. cetera. Um, Rob, Frank Robinson. Anyway, uh, Ned Garver won 20 games, 12 losses. He had a 373 ERA on a team that did have Satchel Page, but didn't have, uh, had only one other player with an ERA under four on that squad. They were that bad. They were 52 and 162. And you got to remember that Satchel Page was, <laughs> was about 60 going on, <laughs> going on Moses' age of 800 years old. He was still effective though. Uh, but I, I'm just saying some of these guys. And the problem with Ned Garver was this. And, and here's what the real shame is. Uh, this is when you start to say, are these guys thinking? Do you realize on that team, Ned Garver, he pitched in his career over 2,400 innings. He compiled 129 wins with 157 losses. I think he played on maybe in his career, I think he played on maybe three teams that had above 500 records in his career. And here's the interesting thing. One of his teammates on that 51 team was a guy by the name of Tommy Byrne who would pitch for the Yankees, not once, but twice. He came from the Yankees in a trade and then would go back to the Yankees in a trade. I think he was with Kansas City at the time. But Tommy Byrne pitched on that team too. And I always think this, oh, if the Yankees had just seen Ned Garver. I think that Ned Garver, when I look at his stats, uh, probably you would consider him kind of like a catfish hunter type of pitcher. But can you imagine had Ned Garver played on a halfway decent team in his career? Now, look, everybody gets saddled with lousy teams. There are many players who have played forever with perpetually bad teams and succeeded. I think about Rod Carew, uh, who played pretty much with mediocre Minnesota teams uh, before getting traded to the Angels. I'm thinking of really um, Ernie Banks. Ron Santo, pretty mediocre teams, even though that's another story for another day with that whole Chicago Cub uh, outfit there. You have five, four or five, I said one time, four or five future Hall of Famers, and they never even won a division, let alone uh, a pennant. And I think they may be uh, the, the only team with the most Hall of Famers never to get into postseason uh, with that many uh, Hall of Famers on one squad in one year. Anyway, though, can you imagine if Ned Garver had pitched, let's say, had, uh, and, and here's the interesting thing. Garver does get traded. He gets traded, though, constantly to other mediocre teams. He goes to Detroit. He does win. Uh, he wins 20 games, like I said, with the Browns. Then he goes to Detroit and goes 14-11 and 11 for a team that was 68-86. and 86. Yeah, they finished in fifth place, but 68-86. and 86. You're 18 games under 500. Then he goes to Kansas City. And this is why I say it's amazing that the uh, Yankees didn't see this guy. He goes 12 and 11 with a team that finished 73 uh, and 81. Uh, Kansas City. Okay, so he's 12 and 11. He finished actually with L.A. And my whole point is this. You're telling me that the, the Yankees didn't see this guy's talent while he was with the <laughs> athletics <laughs> in Kansas City. And the reason I said it is there have been many instances where the Yankees made many deals in the 50s and early 60s with the Kansas City franchise, which is why they always hated the Yankees, where they would just pluck them off. And they were they said that they were basically uh, just the Yankee farm system, triple A team. So Ned Garver is probably a guy, 43 war lifetime. I would love to see the Veterans Committee just take a look at these guys and really do a sophisticated analysis of their careers and say, almost like this, well, you know, you are great. You are what you are. You are what your uh, record indicates and all the rest of it. I just don't believe that Ned Garver was a pitcher that was basically – 28 games under 500 for his career.
Now, if he was 500 and he played on some competitive teams, indeed, some teams that went to the postseason, then I'd say, ah, he was a mediocre pitcher. I think Garver was more than that. All right, next guy, Ray Herbert. And I had some fun with this guy because uh, I thought I was just going to get a uh, regular type of thing. I thought he was uh, – I. I, I misdirected him. I had a guy named Ron Herbal, uh, who pitched for the San Diego Padres back in the 70s. And I kind of uh, figured it was he. Now, notice, I got to be honest with you. I'm picking out a lot of guys who played for a lot of crummy teams. These cards, with the exception of the L.A. Dodgers and maybe the Cleveland Indian Trail, all these guys are coming from either Kansas City or the Chicago Cubs. So they all stink, <laughs> or not the players, but the team stink. But Ron Herber, Herbert, excuse me, 14 years in the big leagues. He is 104 and 107. Funny thing is, I thought he was just going to be a whole thing. And then as I, I, I start to uh, look through his uh, – Stats. He actually won 20 games in 1962 and made the All Star team. Not only that, but finishes number 29 in the MVP voting. So he was uh, 13 and 10 in 1963. Uh, these, uh, this is with the uh, White Sox. So basically, in those two seasons, he won 33, about a third of the 104 games that he won in his career. So he had some ability. And maybe, unfortunately, uh, it was late. Maybe another guy who uh, maybe had been traded earlier with uh, to a competitive team, maybe he would have been putting up those numbers earlier. And you might be talking about a guy, instead of being 104, 107 in his career, maybe he's 154 and 107 in his career and maybe playing on a couple of pennant winners. Interestingly enough, <coughs> pardon me, I was looking. 1962, uh, Mickey Mantle was the MVP. And here's the fun thing about this, because I did have this guy's baseball card from 1970, I do believe. Rich Rollins, who played third base and first base for the Minnesota Twins, finished eighth in the MVP voting that year. He was 16, 96, 298. And for those who don't... Um, Watch the show each week. When I, I do that, 1696, 298, it's home runs, RBIs, batting average. So Rollins had 16 homers, 96 runs batted in, and he hit 298 for the Minnesota Twins. What he was doing was he was playing third base. They moved Killer, uh, Harmon Killebrew over to first base. Uh, but the interesting thing is that Rollins would eventually be replaced and they would get. Um, Oh, they moved Killebrew back in 65, but um, Rollins would be traded on. And I think he wound up playing at least having a, a stop with the Seattle Pilots in 69 before his career was over in 1970 with the uh, Milwaukee Brewers. But Ron Herbert, this is kind of fun things that you learn uh, as, as you read this, read through this. All right. Johnny Briggs. And I was floored when I saw this, too, because uh, actually, you know, a relative of Johnny Briggs from Patterson, New Jersey. But this is Johnny Briggs. And he was actually from. Let me just shine a light on this. California. All right. He had maybe five years in the league, nine and 11. All right. Another guy that uh, actually played for the A's, Kansas City A's the Indians and the Cubs. So he was milled about with all the crummy teams, but at least he had a career. You know, we make fun of these guys and we call them bums and tomato cans or whatever from the stands. But you know what? At least they were able to put on a major league uniform. And if he spent five years, he's collecting a pension right now from baseball. So he did enough to stay in the big leagues. And he can always say, I got a baseball card, just like Al Farrar said. Uh, in ball four. I always wanted to see myself on a bubblegum court. Well, Johnny Briggs can say that. All right. Next guy, Bobby Adams. Kind of interesting. And I folded my paper here. Uh, Bobby Adams is listed as playing with the uh, Chicago Cubs here. Remember the old Cub logo too? That was the thing too. Uh, the 1970 Cubs, 
they had that more uh, generic Cub logo, and they had it on a, a patch on the side, which I, I really like because it's the team colors of blue and red. Not this one. It's, it looks like a generic one. It looks like a Paddington bear, this one. Maybe that's why they weren't that good in the 50s. But Bobby Adams, actually, he made the all-star team. All right. Bobby, and here's here's the great thing. This Don't ever say that, uh, you know, your parents thought these are a waste of time. Well, there was literature and there was math and there was art and there were statistics and there was – uh, accounting, all the rest of it involved with baseball cards because, look, on the back, number 249. Well, if you didn't collect cards, you wouldn't know what that meant, but that's number 249 in the collection of, let's say, six or seven or 800 cards. So he's pretty early in uh, card collecting. He's the kind of guy uh, that I would probably get about three or four in May, and then I, I'd probably lose him in, I don't know, in the flipping, or we'd put him in our bicycle spokes. And then when I really needed him to complete my set, I couldn't find one of those four. <laughs> but Bobby Adams had a pretty good career in terms of this. Now, this is the 1959 card. And it says here, look at this. I love this. Here, here's the cartoon over here. And it says, Bobby was top in uh, double plays for third baseman in 1953. Now, that's kind of Interesting. Are they saying that he hit the most double plays, hit into the most double plays as a, as a third baseman, or that he was involved in the most double plays as a third baseman? Obviously, I think it's the latter, all right, because these cartoons would never try to make fun of the player whatsoever. And uh, so you, you got quite a bit of information on the back of these cards. Their stats, you know, height, weight, where they grew up. You learned a little bit about geography. Many of the players, especially if they didn't have a long career, uh, and I would say if they were in the league, let's say three, four years, and they wanted to fill up the back of the card, they might even give you their stops in AAA and AA. So that was probably pretty cool too. You knew you made it though uh, with this. If you turn the card, I'm, I'm almost guaranteed on the Aarons, the Mantles, the Mays, the Benches, uh, the Clementes, all you'll see is this. You may see up here his stats and his number. You won't see a cartoon. You'll just see because they have no room because the, the uh, players played so long in the major leagues and he's such a great player that he wants those stats. And, you know, here's the other thing, too. These stats on the back were extremely valuable to understand in the game because there was no such thing as the Internet and baseball reference. Baseball Encyclopedia, which really started this whole wave. Bill James always says that he used uh, the, uh, I'm the Joe Reichler uh, edited uh, Baseball Encyclopedia, where he puts all the people in alphabetical order and has all of their stats from all the way back, turn of the century and, uh, you know, early or late 1890s, 1880s, etc. cetera. Uh, didn't have those until about 1973, 74. And it was a big book like this. So as kids, you relied on these to find out the guy's stats each week. You know, we were lucky in the metropolitan area that we could watch the Mets and the Yankees with some sort of uh, consistency on television where they would run their stats of the players when they came to bat. So we were pretty much, you know, um, Updated constantly with the guy's stats. And of course, you know, the Sunday uh, sports section, it would have the list that they were great. The stats each week for uh, baseball, it was great. But didn't have baseball encyclopedia, didn't have baseball reference, baseball almanac, around all the other uh, statistical places that were giving you all of the accounting of the player's uh, individual work on the field. So Bobby Adams, though, interestingly enough, he actually led the league in games, 154, and in uh, at bats with 637. And he actually made the All Star team with the Cincinnati Reds. I'm going to put this up here again. And he actually finished 22nd in the MVP uh, list uh, with the Reds that year. His best year, he had 85 runs scored. 
He had six homers, 48 RBIs, and a 283 batting average. And I think it was 1962 that he did that. Let me just see. Yep. I'm going to say it was like 1962, Bobby Adams. And, of course, then he goes on to uh, Chicago, uh, Baltimore, and then Chicago. And uh, he goes to the, to the White Sox, Baltimore, and then to the Cubs and then his career. But he got 14 years in, and he does finish 22nd in the MVP vote. The funny thing is, and this is something – I'd like to get into later on too, but just, just to bring it up now so I don't forget it. The guy who actually won the MVP was Hank, Sa uh, Hank Sauer that year. His war was 5.6. Now, look, we can't really talk about war way back in the 50s and the 60s and even the 70s. And to a certain – well, we can't really – you can't think about war – in the last half of the 20th century, simply because it wasn't a metric of use. But it is interesting in this respect. There's no way Hank Sauer would have won the MVP today if they had the war uh, then. And what I mean is this, Hank Sauer had a 5.6 war. Well, Robin Roberts, who finished third in the MVP, had an 8.6. Musial and Robinson. Musial finished third and Robinson finished second. I believe he finished second uh, or he finished fourth that year. Jackie Robinson uh, also had higher wars than Sauer. Now, I got to be honest with you. I don't even know why Sauer was even recognized. Yes, he leads the league in home runs and RBIs. <laughs> But the Cubs finish in fifth place, and they're in a 500 team. It's the Andre Dawson uh, mentality all over again. I guess they thought that the team would have been worse had Sauer not led the league in home runs and RBIs. Now, probably there's a prejudice against Roberts winning it because, you know, I know that many writers don't like to give it to a pitcher. You're talking about Musial, who's uh, Cardinals finished in third place, and Robinson, whose Brooklyn Dodgers finished in first place, won the pennant, lost to the Yankees in 52, why they weren't considered. Now, I can maybe understand why Robinson didn't win it in this respect. Brooklyn had been winning and winning and winning. So it's almost like with the Yankees now today winning. I, I, I don't think you'll really see – uh, a Yankee win the MVP unless he does just he just has one of those monster years where he's the leader in home runs, RBIs, and he hits 350. I doubt that you'll see a Yankee win the MVP because everybody feels well. The Yankees are primed to win every year. They sign the best players. Uh, they they should be there every year. One guy doesn't make a difference. Yada 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 yada. Interesting thing is how many times the Yankees did win in the 50s and 60s with Mantle three times, Barra three times, uh, Maris twice, etc. cetera. So, uh, but there was really, Sauer hit two, uh, 288 home runs lifetime, 266 batting average. He had only 876 RBIs. He had a 25.2 uh, war. He was good. Yeah, he probably had his greatest season ever, but was it MVP? I mean, and don't, th and don't forget, in three, four years, the selectors are going to name Banks not just once but twice the MVP with teams that were just as terrible. And that's not an indictment against Banks. It's I'm just wondering, what are these guys thinking of? And uh, are today's voters a little bit more erudite? <clears throat> are they doing more research? Are they taking in, let's say, more consideration, not just the new metrics, but the value of what a player is, not just statistically, but those little things that now can be seen uh, because every game is videotaped and every uh, highlight is is maximized. Uh, so it, it's interesting. I don't know. It, it just seems to me that you have three MVPs from the Cubs in about five years. 
all right, two go to the Hall of Fame. But really, they were probably uh, more valuable players on other teams. All right, now we got the Fred Qu uh, Kipp, K-I-P-P. -P. As I said, it looked like King to me. Now, I will tell you this. I know these cards aren't worth. They are not mint condition. So, uh, basically, you know, they might complete people's sets to make them valuable. Uh, they, I just know from being a card collector and working for a magazine, I mean, these have to be in mint condition. There can't be any tears, perforations. There can't be any stains on them. Uh, there can't be any folds. Uh, there can't, can't be any markings on them at all. Okay. But Fred Kipp is an interesting, interesting uh, guy because the first thing I got was the Wikipedia page on him. And I never realized this. Oh, by the way, he's probably the only one here. Oh, no, they all did. But I can actually read his handwriting, Fred Kipp. And uh, Fred Kipp was... He is right now the sole surviving member of the New York Yankee Brooklyn Dodger uh, group. Players that played for both. He is the last surviving member, according to Wikipedia. He also wrote a book called The Yankee Dodger or something like that, or The New York Dodger. Uh, story, I guess, about his career. The funny thing is, had he not had had that distinction in the book, he was six and seven with a 508 ERA and 64 strikeouts. His last season was 1960. And I, I, I apologize. I didn't do uh, my research on this. I did want to see whether he pitched in the 60 World Series for the Yankees so that he got in there. But it says here, Fred has a wicked knuckleball. I just love that. Fred has a wicked knuckleball. Well, it's wicked in terms of it was bad because he had a 508 ERA and uh, a six and seven record. He was not the, the knuckleballer that <laughs> Phil Necro was. But hey, look, you're trying to put anything up there and notice that the cartoon is bigger as the stats underneath are fewer. <laughs> so, you know, they're trying to give this guy as much headlines, as much press, as much publicity as possible. And of course, there he is, card number 258. Actually, um, Ray Herbert was 154, just in keep, keeping in line here. Johnny Briggs was 177. And I always thought that there was, um, and of course, Ned Garver was 245. He was from Nay, Ohio. I often wondered whether they saved number one for uh, a real great player or just a guy who they just wanted to start the list with. Only because I say this, you would think that by 1970, Maybe Henry. Oh, I did have Henry Aaron's card. And I showed that to you on the uh, episode about Henry Aaron. It's a great card. I love that card. And, um, but like Aaron was not number one. And uh, Mays was certainly not, you know, sometimes you, I think Mays might have been number 600 now that I think about it for tops. He might have been 600, which is a big deal. You know, that 100. You know, 200, 300, 400. So I think that Mays might have been 600. Maybe somebody who watches the show can uh, contact me with that later. Well, here's the last one of the cards. And this one is probably my most exciting one. And <clears throat> even Brian saved it for last. It was great. The Destruction Crew of the Cleveland Indians, who had some fantastic teams in the 50s and early 60s. Of course, they uh, go to the uh, World Series in 54. They've won the World Series in 48, of which Larry Doby is a member, and he's right here. Let's just see if I can do this right. Right there. That's Larry Doby. Uh, he was a member of that 48 Cleveland team and also the 54 team. And then I think he moved on to the White Sox in uh, 59. I'm not sure. And Minnie Minoso, who I know was on the White Sox. The interesting thing uh, with this, Minoso – and uh, Calavito and uh, Doby, you could, and people have had arguments about, well, first of all, Doby is in the Hall of Fame. 
many people want Monoso in there. <clears throat> Calavito is kind of just uh, a notch below. And he, he, here, here's why everyone says it. And of course, I'm running out of time right now. Uh, but Calavito, 374 home runs lifetime, 266 batting average, 1,159 career RBIs. He led the league three or he had three times where he hit 40 or more home runs. He had uh, he led the league with 42 and 59. And he also led in RBIs with 108 and 65. And twice he led in total bases with 301 and 309. Far fewer than Henry Aaron ever did in his unbelievable splendid career. And that's why Aaron is up here and everybody else is right here. The interesting thing about Calavito, as I remember, he does get traded for Harvey Kuhn, and Cleveland fans were outraged on that. They were just totally, totally, mm. and uh, it never worked out uh, for the Indians after that. So that was a big thing with him. Larry Doby, of course, Hall of Famer, seven-time All-Star, 49.3 war. I looked this up. I'm pretty sure this is true. He's the only player who's led the league twice in home runs with the same number, 32. And then uh, the last thing, and of course I'm running out of time, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll continue this next week, but I just want to get this in. Minnie Minoso was a fantastic player, a 50.2 war, nine-time All-Star, three-time Gold Glove, 186 home runs, 298 batting average, 298 batting average, 1,023 RBIs. We got to look into him as about being an MVP, uh, a Hall of Famer. This is Will O'Toole thanking you again for joining me with Park Ridge Sports History. See you next week, and I will continue with this next week. Thank you.